Here we go. Let's start it and let's try to have it uh, run in 20 minutes maximum. So uh, first thing, who am I? One slide. I'm a Belgian guy, meaning that obviously you can speak to me about Belgian beer, chocolates and French fries, which technically speaking I'm not, um, I don't agree with that, that should be called Belgian fries and not French fries, but we can discuss that during the beer if you want. Um, but that's off topic. So. I'm here to talk about, obviously, CentOS, the project, and also um, Open Nebula and the relationship between the two projects. I'm a CentOS user and a user for a long time, and I'm a project member since 2007, if I remember well. So, first question, it's a quick survey. Who does know CentOS in the room? Please raise the hand. I was really expecting a 100% each rate on that question. <laughs> so the next question, who is using CentOS? Yeah, cool. Still some people to convince, it seems. So, um, so yeah, a lot of people know at least what CentOS project is. So if I ask you, for example, what is the CentOS project, what, can I, what kind of answer can I have? For example, someone, quickly, what's CentOS project? Remy. <laughs> Yeah, that was a valid question and valid answer in the past. So, yes, obviously we are known for the CentOS core Linux distribution that we started to build uh, 10 years ago, well, 11 years ago. But we decided to change a little bit, so you are still building the distribution that a lot of you are using. But it's nowadays more than just core Linux distribution. It's, we like to call us anymore um, in the future the CentOS project, meaning that it's a platform on which other software projects can build and rely upon. So uh, that's the reason why, for example, we decided to introduce a new concept. Um, it was last year we announced the SIG. Well, it's a strange name for Special Interest Group. So I had to mention at least one link in the, in the slides. Here we go. So what is a Special Interest Group? It's a group of people sharing, for example, um, interest in a specific topic or specific area. Like, for example, um, we have some people having a, an interest in virtualization, for example, or in storage or in cloud solution. And um, they can meet and we help those people uh, have meetings and, and share some packages, for example, some ID. Uh, the first um, special interest group, before it was even uh, announced as a special interest group, was the virtualization SIG. Um, from a CentOS project point of view, we don't have the same constraint as obviously the one that exists at the Red Hat Enterprise Linux version, right? So when um, Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux dropped completely the dumb zero support for Xen in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, some people said, well, we are sad about that. We would like to have, for example, Xen support. And so, um, People from CentOS project work with people from the Xen project from Citrix, and well, the, prison, the, the previous speaker was Lars, so Lars was leading that effort, uh, and we introduced back a Xen support, Xen Dam Zero support for CentOS 6. And that's the reason for, uh, why, for example, those communities uh, were able to produce that. So we have other um, people, for example, interested in storage like uh, Gluster, uh, Ceph, Seth at the moment is also a member of the, um, the storage SIG, but is still well, waiting for, uh, to build some package uh, on the build system. So the goal of, um, of a special interest group are obviously just to build artifacts. The artifact being most of the time RPM packages, but that can be images, uh, is, a, is a distribution of whatever. But it's not only about building things, because uh, well, when you build something, obviously you want to test that, right? So uh, you want to validate that everything works through the tra traditional candidate testing, and then oh, well, the Larsen is with us today, it seems. And then obviously we want to release. So from a build point of view, what can we do? As a central, wow, that scares me a lot. <laughs> At least I'm pretty sure that you stay awake. That's a good thing. So um, on our side, what we provide for the people interested in specific interest group, we provide a complete build farm 
It's actually built on top of Koji. Uh, I guess that a lot of uh, users know what Koji is. So it's a distributed build environment. And we use actually um, our own internal uh, certification system just to, uh, to do authentication. We will switch in the following weeks to uh, the, the same um, accounting system used by Fedora, so FAST. Uh, we'll announce that publicly soon. So meaning that a lot of people, for example, sharing uh, same interests, like for example, OpenEbola. OpenEbola is a member as well um, from the CloudSeq. Uh, so we have other communities in the CloudSeq, uh, including, for example, uh, OpenStack through RDO. You know, RDO is supposed to be the, an easy way to install OpenStack. And then I realized that I say easy way to install OpenStack, and there's something wrong maybe. Um, but at the moment, OpenEbola is also a member of the, uh, the CloudSeq. Um, and we expect some packages to land soon. Because, for example, at the moment, um, someone mentioned earlier today that, for example, there are problems when you want to install OpenEbola, you have to you know, install all those RubyGem packages, well, packages by hand. So we hope to see that fixed soon and built automatically through the CentOS build system and validated through the CentOS system, meaning that as CentOS user, you will be able to just you know, install CentOS Linux and install directly, for example, OpenEbola test it and validate with Ceph or storage or, or Gluster as storage solution. So that's for the build system. But then we know we, we have a bunch of machines uh, that you can use and abuse like uh, crash test dummies. That's called uh, our CI environment that we also launched. Uh, it's an um, isolated, obviously, network environment close to the build system that we have, sponsored by Red Hat. Thanks, Red Hat, for that. It's completely Jenkins driven. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, obviously. So it's a, we have a bunch of Jenkins plugin install uh, to, to do that. And all the special interest group can test everything they want. The good thing is that we have at our disposal at the moment 2056 bare metal machine. And we want to have bare metal machine because if you want to validate, for example, that the cloud solution works, you don't want to use nested virtualization, obviously. So you want to be as close as possible to what you will, you, you will have in production environment, in real life scenario. So uh, those machines have also a fast SSD disk in the fabric mode so that people can just use and abuse that. So what we just have, and that's really um, a little thing in between Jenkins and the rest of the system is that we have a, a very lightweight middleware called Duffy. We, have, we like to use strange name in the CI environment. So that when, for example, a project request some bare metal node that can be five nodes, for example, um, they have those machines directly. They are pre-provisioned in advance in an allocation pool. And they, those Jenkins jobs can be triggered by hand, by cron job, by whatever you want. That can even be by build, because then there is a link between, obviously, the Koji build farm and automatically the CI environment. And, um, when everything is tested, it goes back to provision mode and allocation pool. The last uh, good thing about the, um, that environment is that, well, you have built something. You have also artifacts, you have built logs, you have test logs. Everybody can have a look at that. If you are, for example, happy with the results, that um, yeah, something is built, tested, etc., you want to release it. That's also um, where we as CentOS platform can help you with that because you don't need to take those artifacts. We take care of that. You just say, hey, I want, for example, those OpenEbola packages to be built, signed, and released, and available on the CentOS mirror automatically. Um, that means that, for example, at the moment, um, we have a very, very modern monitoring systems. Um, yeah, it's not that one, but at least it works that can, for example, uh, distribute all those packages to our 60 mirror at the moment uh, that are spread all around, the, uh, all around the world. And those packages should land automatically on more than 600 external mirror. And we use a kind of PDNS, uh, PowerDNS GOIP redirection so that you are redirected to the, um, your nearest mirror. So that's one of the good things um, we hope is to see soon openable a package on the official CentOS mirror. Why do we want to, to see that happening? Because we like alternative. We like to see a bunch of, for the CentOS user, we like to see uh, every possible solution. And we say that we are just a platform on which other projects can build. The good thing is that as um, CentOS, inside of CentOS, we are also OpenEbola users. 
because it's so well it was really easy to to set up so most of the time we have we are just running on donated machines so we have just one machine there one machine here um, so that's not the classical way of of setting up a cloud but we have uh, still uh, one data center in which we have uh, several machines that are located uh, donated for us and we are just using that with what we call it the dev cloud, meaning that CentOS developer inside can just request or instantiate some, um, some cloud image directly on Open Nebula. From our side, what we have learned, um, depending on how, well, I should probably just uh, send some pull requests against the Open Nebula uh, official documentation because it works perfectly fine with SLNX enable everywhere. Just another quick survey. Who is using SLNX here? That means that I have more work to do then. <laughs> so, um, CVE 3465, uh, yes. does that ring a bell, anyone? Yeah. <laughs> Venom thing, whoa. And then CVE 5154, I had to wrote that because the, the QMUCD CD emulation bug. Do you know that those uh, patch, those CVE were in fact mitigated if you were just running SLNX on the hypervisor level? That's probably one reason why you want to have also SLNX uh, enabled even at the hypervisor level. And Open Nebula works perfectly fine. The only thing that you have to, to change is just one simple context for the var lib onesh um, directory to have the correct ssh underscore home underscore t thing. That's the only thing that you have to do. So that's just two simple lines. So I will just probably just um, try to have a, a pull request on the documentation for that. The other thing we uh, learned is that uh, we had a strange setup, so we decided to use Gluster, but it failed quickly for some strange reason. Gluster, how much people have used Gluster here in the room? Okay, happy with the result? Yes, no, maybe? Doesn't seem so. Oh, maybe it's too late in the afternoon. So in our case, we discovered that we were just running Gluster in distributed or replicated. So distributed normally is normally fast, and obviously using replication because we want to have some kind of fault tolerance. But then I, well, Gluster is really easy to set up. The problem is that um, sometimes you see that, some, something you don't understand really is that normally when you think that you have the duplication that's happening at the storage level. In Gluster, that's not the case. In fact, the Gluster client is just talked to a Gluster metadata server that tells back, that says back, okay, you need to write that data yourself to, for example, two server, meaning that you divided your bandwidth by two automatically. Oh, bad. So if you are not running on 10 gigabits uh, Ethernet connection, forget about it. The other thing that was possible for us was just to migrate to InfiniBand. How much people are using InfiniBand in the room? more people. I was surprised myself to see that InfiniBand is really damn easy to set up. If you know already the, um, the, IP, the, the TCP IP stack, just implementing, for example, InfiniBand, well, you can use it with RDMA directly, but if you just want to migrate transparently the, um, the OpenNebula data store, which I did, you just need to implement IP over InfiniBand. So you just, in fact, use your HBA as a traditional 10 gigabit network card, or 20 or 40, depending on your, your budget, right? But that's really something you can do. Just one remark, if you are using that, cluster with infinite bands. I guess that a lot more, a lot more people are using iSCSI in the room, right? What is the thing that you should implement with iSCSI if you are using iSCSI? Multipath, Multipath yeah, for tolerance. What about the speed? How do we speed up iSCSI? Jumbo frame, yes. A lot of people are just missing um, Jumbo frame on iSCSI. So you, uh, you can do exactly the same thing if you are implementing IP over infinite band for Gluster. Less, less of an issue with, uh, new <coughs> Sorry? It's less of an issue with new network yes, it depends if you have a, um, a TCP offload engine on the card as well, yes. If you want to implement, for example, uh, IP over infinite band, by default on CentOS, it will just try to use the um, datagram mode meaning that you will just have something like a 2044-byte two, MTU, which is really low. But if you switch suddenly to, data, to connected mode, you, you go up to 65,000K MTU, and then your storage is really flying. 
So we saw a big, big, big improvement to switching from a traditional uh, Gluster over Ethernet to Gluster over Infinite Band in uh, datagram mode, uh, in connected mode. The other improvement was obviously to also switch from Fuse because Fuse is really, is anything but interesting. So, because you have a big, big overhead, so you just, switch, you just have to switch to lib GFAPI. So, itself, OpenAble itself still need a fuse mount point to, ma to manipulate the images, but as soon as a virtual image is started, it just told directly through the API from Gluster, and it doesn't need the, the, um, the fuse mount point anymore. Yeah, um, that was my last slide anyway. <laughs> So yeah, I, did, I wanted to, to have it quick. So uh, that's the last slide. So if you have questions about life, universe, and everything, my answer will be 42 anyway. So <laughs> no questions. Start. Muchas gracias.